All right. Give me some audio and a little countdown, perhaps. We are good. Okay, great. We have audio. I'm sorry, you guys. We were so busy working with the anamorphic lenses and the J.J. Abrams production value that uh, we forgot about audio. Um, audio is half the picture. Abrams, no. J.J. Abrams, that? I'm not sure. All right, we're back. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're back. Everybody's talking about our beautiful, beautiful anamorphic lens flares. This is T-Rex Talk. I'm Isaac. This is Lucas. Uh, this is the no leak stream, right? Uh, th uh, that, that is correct. Are you, are you ready for no leaks? I just started drinking a rain, so I can either confirm or deny that leaks will occur on this stream. <sighs> I also said no spoilers uh, in the description sure. of the video. I could oh, wait, edit, what, I what's could, it called? I could edit oh, that okay, afterwards. Right. I could edit the, uh, the no spoilers thing afterwards, but it technically says no spoilers at the moment. Uh, uh, these are not actually Michael Bay lens flares. These are J.J. Abrams lens flares. Uh, People do get them mixed up. They're, they're easy to mix up. Do you, you know I actually... <laughs> actually really, I actually really like those. Could, those are could nice. Could go through some uh, Cook lens science. On, so that's uh, what all those hundreds of dollars got us. Cool. I like it. Yeah. All right. So... What are we talking about? What are you talking, talking about? about? We're talking about what makes a good holster. So uh, I have a bunch of examples of holsters that we have made. Um, some people wanted some examples of bad holsters. Uh, I've got from, lots of those. From our competitors. Or from us. I thought that we made enough bad holsters back in the day that we could demonstrate some bad stuff of our own. So that's what I'm planning to do here. Now, Look it this could piece be. piece of work. Look at this. Look at this amazingness. Yeah, it, we have, we've come a long way since we made holsters like that. Now, it could be that people think that since uh, uh, certain products are unavailable, Sure. On yeah. our website, mm -hmm. and we're talking about those kinds of products right now. That there might be clues, or you should choose your words leaks, very carefully, <laughs> or very spoilers. But we said there weren't going to be any leaks. That's right. There's, any there's none of those. We're, we're, People ask you know, way too much. The, uh, we're just talking about what makes a good holster. That's all that it is. Um, yeah, so that's what we're doing tonight, uh, and uh, and you're here with me talking about uh, talking about no leaks. I'm here to am, I'm here to answer questions about holsters that we have been making for years. All right, and some of which I made myself back yes. in the day. Uh, this uh, is an old sidecar. Uh, I pulled this out uh, the other day for some stuff that I was working on, and uh, the sidecar design, which has been kind of the flagship product of T Rex Arms, uh, was really the first popularized one piece. Uh, appendix carry holster. So pistol mag fused into the holster for the weapon. And when I first started making them, they were horribly big. Uh, there was a lot of kydex, a lot of material. The clip was way over here. I didn't put the clip on the front. I wanted to kind of space things out. Not the most comfortable holster ever, uh, but people bought them. Uh, we sold a lot of these in this configuration before we slowly, you know, trimmed it back and cut some stuff away and mounted the clip on the front. And uh, this is an old personal one I have. It's all, you're not going to be able to see it, but it's all just absolutely chewed up, chewed up from back lot, when I actually shot and dry fired a lot. Fire. That's I don't also, know how I chewed up that bad. This is also an interesting custom uh, cloth. Yes, I can't remember why I angled mine downwards. I think just because I, the way, yeah, I have the, I, I see what it is. I have the holster riding so high, I didn't like having the clip above my pants. So I actually trimmed that down. Um, so yeah, so the sidecar has gone through lots of revisions and improvement it from, and this has. isn't even, this isn't even like the first one. Uh, and then we went to this and uh, so yeah. And it's then we fun. started making them on the CNC machines. This is a, yeah. This is a, a more recenter one that is vacuum formed, CNC cut. The claw has That's changed orange. from being a handmade piece oh. of Kydex to an injection molded piece of acetal. And it has- And now you're blind. It's, uh, yeah. This is uh, for signaling, by the way, having orange on the back. So yeah, the side cars had lots of cool. The side cars had lots of improvements. Yeah. Well, that too. But so also we've, been, we've been making holsters for, uh, you've been making holsters for about seven years. Eight years now. Eight years. I've been yep. making holsters for five or six years, mm -hmm. and uh, we have learned a little bit about holsters. Actually, correction, I haven't made a holster in about four years, <laughs> so I actually only made holsters. <laughs> I actually only made holsters for two years because I stopped doing that and went to forming. You've been making holsters longer than I have. Actually. Well, you bring up an excellent point because technically there are now so many stations. There are parts of the holster making process that I don't do. In fact, I am banned yeah. from using buffing wheels. I'm not, not allowed to buff the edges of the holsters here anymore. There was an incident, uh, so that's not allowed. But when it comes to 
making the models uh, of the guns and making the uh, vacuum forming forms. That is something that that uh, I have been doing for a long time and I'm still very involved in design work and making holsters fit well and do the important things. So let's talk about, uh, that's some procedural stuff. I was about to say. Stuff. So the, the stream Internet. is frozen currently. Oh, do Internet we still down. have, uh, do we still it have the uh, VPN up and running? It's, yeah. uh, it's cutting in and out. We can assume it'll be back, but. Big F. Yeah. Big F. Uh, we can assume, okay. we can. It looks like. Oh, interesting. It's not on our end. Do we? Are, yeah, we should disable the VPN if we have it. Well, we needed it to work last time. Oh, it shoot. Wouldn't. I don't know. Close it, and you click on it again. Hmm. No, uh, it's buffering pretty bad. Yeah. How is audio, Oh, wait, I think guys? we're back. Can I think you we're still, back. Can you still yeah. hear us with the audio? We had this issue a little while ago. I, uh, I still think that we're having a bit of a oh, bit of an issue. Oh, hey, there we go. So okay. let's let's talk a little bit. What, in your opinion, uh, even though you've stopped making holsters somewhat recently, you use holsters a bunch. I, I lied. And I just did, actually. I just went to the range. Uh, yes, and I also use holsters. But what do you think makes a good holster? I was asking different people in the shop. Some of us are a little biased because we do work for a holster company. And yet, uh, I feel like we spend a lot of time thinking about holsters, experimenting with different stuff. Yeah. What do you think? I think the biggest thing uh, for a holster uh, is accessibility. Uh, I really think that should be number one. Obviously, durability, not falling apart on you. There's holsters out there that, you know, the screws all come out, they fall apart, you know, they're $20 holsters. But uh, I actually believe, and that's that was the focus behind the sidecar originally, um, was accessibility. Having a full grip, you can actually get on and actually grab the handgun and actually draw. Uh, but the same goes for a outside the waistband holster, where as I go to grip the weapon, I'm not scraping past a holster, I'm not scraping past my pants, I'm, I'm just going straight to the grip to build that good uh, dominant hand grip on the gun. Uh, I think accessibility is number one, and I've seen some really weird holsters before T-Rex and during the early days of T-Rex from other companies, where uh, in, in a concealment you know, fashion, the grip is sitting below your belt line, it's you know, deep concealed carry, which there's a purpose behind some of that, but you're sacrificing a lot by doing something like that. Uh, so for me, it's accessibility. You know, when I go to actually draw the gun, I have it and mm -hmm. I'm, I can get on it quickly. And then there's durability and there's consistency and yeah. there's you know, all that good stuff, well, concealment. Well, we have talked stuff. a lot in the past about like the triangle of of that accessibility and, yeah. and speed, comfort and concealability, mm -hmm. and you can pick two. Yep. Now I think <laughs> inside the waistband appendix gives you the best balance of all three of those, but it definitely is the most concealable and the fastest. Like yep. four o'clock is actually more comfortable and fast, sure. but not yeah, concealable. Yeah. Shoulder holster, very concealable, very comfortable, but not fast. Yeah. Um, so that, that triangle is the thing we talk about, but you mentioned a bunch of other things. There's reliability, there is uh, safety. There mm -hmm. are holsters that are very good in some ways, but they don't actually cover enough of the trigger to prevent stuff from snagging inside the trigger guard. So yep. there are some safety Happens. considerations uh, in addition to the durability and the accessibility and the ease of yep. use and things like that. So, yeah. Uh, I think Honestly, the, I think the biggest misconception people have on holsters is uh, the Blackhawk Serpa is actually a great example. Uh, people believe it's a flawed holster design where the button where you uh, deactivate the active retention will put you in a position to fire the weapon. Uh, the answer is no, your finger going in the trigger guard will fire and discharge the weapon. I have seen people with sidecars and other Penix carry holsters, not seen, well, um, uh, close, um, yeah, no. but uh, <laughs> where they've discharged the firearm early uh, or late yeah early uh in the draw process um and that's not the holster's fault that's their finger going into the trigger guard and the serpa is a good example because you know your finger's out there touching the button but in order to actually like drive your finger into the trigger guard from hitting the button it's actually very difficult and i used to use a serpa back in the day like forever ago i wouldn't tell anyone that personally i wouldn't but you can sure but yeah. uh I used to use one back in the day, and I tried as hard as I could after the whole Tex Grebner thing and uh, with the 226, and I couldn't even get to the trigger while like hitting the button. Like I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, so as far as holsters goes, regardless of how the holster is designed, 
whether the trigger guard is fully exposed, fully covered, whatever. Uh, as soon as the gun is actually cleared the holster, that's generally when people shoot themselves. Yeah. Uh, you know, with their finger going into the trigger guard, uh, clothes going into the trigger guard, that happens too. Uh, but that's almost any holster though. Any holster yes. you can have that. I could be reholstering into my sidecar right now. My shirt could get tucked in there, this like little hard edge and the trigger could get pulled, regardless of design. Really. That's true. Now, we have seen some issues in the past, all of us, where, uh, if you have a leather holster and the leather eventually gets worn out, the leather itself can be an issue. But yeah, be very aware of clothing. You know, defeat the garment properly or the garment will defeat you. Um, there's a reason that we have this shirt guard here. The shirt guard doesn't actually stop sweat from getting on your gun because sweat is a liquid and it can, you know, go around stuff. And it doesn't actually stop your shirt from getting inside of here because it would have to be really, really tall to do that. But it does help your shirt be manageable. The main thing that this, uh, this shirt guard here is is an indexing point. So as you're reholstering, you have something that you can put the muzzle of the gun against and slide it down in there. It does help with the shirt thing, but you can't trust it. If you lift your shirt more than this far, then your shirt could potentially go on the other side of the sweat guard. So there's, yeah, there's a bunch of safety considerations for sure, but that requires people to be safe with the gun once it's outside of the holster as well. Don't shoot yourself. Yeah. Don't it's... don't put your finger in the trigger guard when you're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. It's the best way to not have problems. Mm -hmm. Now, I would love to so. demonstrate some of this stuff with an actual gun, but YouTube has a rule that says you cannot handle firearms uh, in uh, during a live stream. Um, and uh, Or have guns uh, visible. Uh, no, I think they can be visible as long as you don't handle them. Are you serious? Yeah. I thought, I, mean, they tracked, I thought they tracked silhouettes or they track hands with guns. They, their, their artificial intelligence algorithms are actually Great, very, Skynet. very, very good. Yeah, Skynet's getting really good at telling whether you're holding a gun because uh, oh, obviously there's no guns visible. What if you wear, what if you have like a um, motion capture mitts with all the little white dots? It's possible that that would confuse like, it. There's, I mean, hmm. we should, there's some We stuff should that, find out if there's some gloves, like oven mitts or something I can wear to then Boxing dry fire and <laughs> demonstrate with guns and yeah. uh, put optics on guns, Lego hands, and be able to then like do stuff. You should get some strong bad boxing gloves to do your weapon manipulation drills. That's a reference that would be <laughs> fine. <laughs> Probably very few people in here get. So one of the uh, things, well, not everyone's as old as I am. So one of the things that, that uh, we have chosen to do as a holster company as well, we want to cover the trigger up so that the trigger is covered so that it is safe. Regardless of who you're buying from, there's some great holster companies out there, but uh, Kyle asked that this video be a little bit more timeless reference, not uh, not just be uh, strong bad jokes and uh, uh, allusions to something that may or may not be happening in the future. That uh, that's that is true. That's correct. You know, some changes can't be made quietly. Our IW holsters are temporarily unavailable for purchase while we finish the last major steps in reaching our production line, etc. This is supposed to be a more you know, timeless video where we talk about holsters. Holster design. Um, and I would say that there's a lot of great holster companies out there that are not T-Rex arms, but there's a couple things to watch out for. Safety is a huge one, mm -hmm. uh, and a really good way to just sort of double check a holster manufacturer is, are they covering the trigger guard properly? Um, another one would be what they do with the mag release. And I, I agree with that. I would yeah. say that there's <laughs> there's a couple of ways to, to take care of the mag release problem, which is either you expose the mag release so the holster cannot press on it. So as you bend the holster, it doesn't press the mag release and pop your mag out. Either they cover it up completely with a larger thing so that it can't happen, or they, what we do is we remove the Kydex so that you can't actually press the mag release with the, the holster, but mm -hmm. you can get to it with your thumb. So. Those yep. are a couple things that you look for, I would say, just to figure out how um, thoughtful uh, the holster maker is being. Um, but that yeah. the ability to access the trigger is amazing. Now, there are a couple of holsters that we make where you can sort of touch the edge of the trigger guard with your finger. But if you cannot get your finger inside to pull the trigger, that's really the main thing that we're aiming for. Uh, optic cuts. I saw a, uh, a larger company or more renowned company um, make a optic cut holster for a pistol. Granted, it was a pistol that's not super common. Uh, that was not actually optic cut. Uh, it wasn't low enough. And that's actually something to watch for. Not every uh, holster company is doing, uh, I would say, relevant uh, research when new guns come out. Uh, you can look at some stuff online and then make some guesses. Uh, something we try to do here is we get the, like, we go buy every gun we make a holster for. Like, we have, you know, every gun we make a holster for, we scan it, we, you know, caliper it, we make sure it actually fits. We come into the armory, we put optics on them if we can, we, 
uh, the weird, the biggest optic we can find. Um, and I, I don't think some holster companies are going that far. They're just looking at, which in the early days, that's when I mean, you don't have a lot of money, you kind of have to, but you yeah. just look at a pistol that comes out, you kind of make some estimates on like, okay, the, you know, the trigger, the ejection port's super far forward. And so I just need to cut, you know, my optic cut down kind of to there and it'll fit everything. But then you have optics like the Trigon SRO that sit in front of, you know, the optic cut itself. So... Um, SRO stands for snoot red dot optic, right? <laughs> yeah, it's very snooty, okay. actually. It's got uh, a long It's not snoot. shooting with one today. It's got but... almost like a beak on the front. <laughs> it's, it, the SRO yeah. is a beak. You're not wrong. So um, let's not go down that road, though. Let's not uh, summon everyone from Twitch. Um, this is YouTube. It's very different than Twitch. The Twitch is very, they're very different. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, uh, Holster companies, and sometimes it's more evident, but uh, I think good holster companies are the ones that are going out there and buying and trying everything and trying to get one in-house. Uh, the only problem with a new holster company starting out is generally they don't have the inroads. I know we didn't when we started um, with big holster, big uh, firearms manufacturers to send us CAD files or send us guns when they're coming out. Um, so when you're smaller, you kind of have to wait for the thing to come out, and then you have to go... Buy one if you can afford it, or borrow one. Um, Get on the phone call with uh, yeah, you know, Tiger Works and find or... out how they're doing the optic cut. Yeah, or, you know stuff like that. <laughs> now I will say one of the things that's interesting is not only have we grown as as a company in terms of being better at our jobs, we've also grown uh, as a company in, in terms of size. So we used to yeah. be a very specialized. When yes. you were running it, you were a very specialized company aiming at a very specialized customer, and you were getting requests for optic compatible holsters probably way before before like, it was common. Like like get this. Back five years ago, I had some holster companies write to me and say, Hey, how many light compatible holsters do you make, like percentage wise? And I said fifty percent. Fifty percent of the holsters we're making are optic compatible or, or weapon light compatible. And they said, wow, we're only uh, 5%, 10%. This was like five years ago when very few weapon lights were really on the market. Six years ago when it was just the X300 Ultra had just come out. Uh, TLR1 was around. The Enforce was just coming out, the APL, the old one. Uh, there really wasn't a lot out. Oh, the TLR3. Uh, oh, the, please don't yeah, mention it. The All TLR3. Right. I, uh... There was like nothing back then. <laughs> and we, I focused on light compatible holsters so much that we really had that segment of people mm -hmm. wanting light compatible inside the waistband holsters. Uh, like the uh, NCOG, another holster inside the waistband holster, they didn't make a weapon light uh, NCOG for like, I think it was like two or three years mm -hmm. after the main one. Uh, they just didn't make one. I mean, that was kind of how the industry went five, six years ago with light compatible holsters. Yeah. Um, so I know our customer, yeah, the demographic we were targeting and I was targeting back then was, you know, weapon lights and pistol optics. Uh, now that's, you know, everyone does it. Like everyone's getting them, everyone's putting lights on their pistols and that's how it should be. Everyone, I hope every holster company out there is making just as many light compatible holsters as they are regular uh, holsters. I hope it's 50-50 or more. It'd be cool if it was more light compatible than non-light. Uh, weapon lights are super important on handguns. Yes. So uh, I really appreciate that you've been pushing that. And one of the things that's been beginning. cool to see is as our uh, customer base has grown, we've actually seen more interest in optics and more interest in uh, light compatible holsters simply because that's just what the market is doing. It's very gratifying to see the market going in that direction. And uh, yeah, there's actually a thing that we're doing later on that light compatible front. I think this can help uh, drive those numbers up. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We cannot. No, that's what you're cannot, talking about. Oh, cannot, okay, okay, okay. We cannot uh, speak to this, of course. Oh, okay, yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's gonna, that's gonna be cool. Um, I'm, I'm trying to read comments. People aren't really asking questions about holsters. Here, okay, I'm gonna say this. Holsters are one of the hardest products to market because they are boring. I'm just gonna say it. Holsters are incredibly, that's probably why there's not a ton of people on the stream, are incredibly boring. Generally speaking, they're an afterthought. You get one, you put it on, you're done. Uh, in, in, you know, inside the waistband holster, you get it, put on, you're done. You don't worry about it. Guns are cooler, nylon's cooler, chest rigs are cooler, plate carriers are definitely easier to market than holsters. Filming holsters and marketing stuff that's hidden by shirts, probably the hardest thing to do. Um, so I know these aren't super interested, although they're very important uh, for people. I mean, honestly, they should be, in my opinion, almost as important as kind of the gun itself from a concealment standpoint. Absolutely. You're yeah. actually, you, you wear the gun on you 
more than you actually shoot the gun. Yeah. So holsters should you be should. just as important, but they're not because they're not fun. Like it's a piece of plastic. Like it's like who cares? It's um, also durable. It's also durable. Yeah. Sorry <laughs> over there. But uh, but they're not. They're not cool. They're not fun. They're just like whatever. Like you can make them in different colors. Cool. But yeah. like. It's a piece of plastic that goes in your pants. No, like it's not that counterpoint. Cool. Oh. Uh, I agree with everything okay. that you just said. But counterpoint, uh, which you kind of made, they are an extremely important item. Oh, they are an extremely oh, important you're not item. Show that. Okay. Uh, I need to context. They are an extremely important sense. item because they allow you to carry your gun in places that you might need your gun. So. When you sell somebody a gun, that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing because you're selling them a useful tool. But if you sell them something that allows them to actually carry and use that gun places, that matters a lot. So we're very excited about the ability to sell holsters, even though yep. they are kind of more boring than some of the other stuff that we do. And I actually got kind of excited because I'm a geek uh, about some of the really geeky stuff that we do. So compatibility is one of the other things that we strive for on top of safety and concealability and stuff. So for example, um, there are slight differences between the Glock Gen 3 and the Glock Gen 5. <laughs> And when you, I'm about to go down to super deep. Yes, geeky no, tell them, all. tell them how, well, how awesome we Gen had a long discussion. Are. Well, I can't actually remember the exact number in thousands, but one of the things that we talked about was for maximum, um, you know, to make the holster feel the best, we could technically make two different holsters. We could make one for Gen 5s, and we could make one for Gen 3s, and we make the customer pick which one they have when they order. Uh, and that would be fine, that would be totally doable. However, we really wanted to give the customer the option of having a holster that would work with both. So that if you're like me and you have a couple of Gen 3s, and then later when you want to switch to a red dot, you buy a Gen 5 used that has a cut mm -hmm. on the top. I want that holster to work for both of those guns that you own. And so we really worked pretty... Uh, <laughs> I'll just say it was a lot of work to get something that worked with both of those. But that's yeah. the kind of thing that we are striving for. Um, we really want this holster to be future compatible so that uh, now all of our holsters are optic compatible. If you get an optic in the future, mm. holster still works. We've started to change the way that we do uh, the profile cuts so that uh, if, if you decide to go with a compensator or a longer gun, mm. everything is open. You can actually Long do boy. that. It will work. It may not be the perfect solution, but it's perfectly functional. So that uh, level of... Um, Future proofing that we want for your holster is a thing that's important to us. Someone's asking, I want to hit this because I think it's very important. Uh, any opinion on the ruling on 18 year olds being able to buy handguns and what's the opinion of 18 year olds concealed carrying? Uh, I think those age restrictions are unconstitutional and stupid. So I'm all for it. I, I agree. Age, the whole like, uh, you are mature and you're allowed to carry a gun at an arbitrary age number, uh, dumb, big dumb. Probably the biggest dumb. I support. People carrying guns, owning guns, buying guns, and my kids are gonna have guns way before they're 18. Um, and uh, I can't I can't wait, so uh, yeah. that's where we stand on that. Did I tell you, uh, we went to an Appleseed event, James and I. Oh, no, and, uh, how was that? He did really well, no, his I, groups got okay. smaller. No, that's good, that's smaller. not quite what I was, uh, I thought it was. I thought it was great. Oh, okay, It was good. especially yeah. great for beginning shooters, especially that's great for that's young good. shooters. Uh, Wasn't sure how uh, uh, fuddy or Two I've, never been, I've never been to one. I, I would say no two idea. thumbs up. Well, I also really appreciated that they let me, you know, walk a five-year-old up with a suppressed Ruger 1022 and a red dot, and they were hey, like, nice. "Cool, he can shoot it off a bipod all day." It's also got a Peck 15 on it and a full power LA5 and a grenade launcher. That was I why like he it. needed the bipod. I guess I like it a lot. Yes. Um, so, uh, someone's asking about some stuff for the sidecar in the future. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that. Um, <laughs> Don't talk Let's about see. future sidecar stuff. Yeah, no, we're not going to talk about anything that we're going to try to do in the future. Oh, well, people do ask a lot about active retention holsters. Um, as of right now, what we recommend, um, 100%, well, not this, but, but let's, sure, uh, is Safari Land. Uh, I use Safari Lands quite a bit, the 6354DO in particular. Uh, this is an old school Beretta SLS thing that I got on eBay. Look at this giant monster. Uh, I have another one over there that's a Ranger contract holster, but uh, uh, great active retention holsters. I did see someone comment earlier, hey, but Spiraland's inventory is, uh, you know, their stock sucks and next, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's getting better. It's getting better. I do understand and that is uh, difficult. I believe part of the issue is they prioritize government and LE orders because it's one big order for a bunch of items with no 
usually super, you know, the lead time's not super important. Whereas dealing with lots of little individual orders to customers requires you have a completely different fulfillment system. Um, you're having to, each one is a unique package shipment with a lead time associated. And I'm going to say right now, when we work, when we do orders for the government or we do orders for citizens, government entities generally don't care when it shows up. Individual citizens who have Amazon Prime want it in two days. So you're dealing with two completely different customers with uh, whatever the product is that you're making. And that's why some of these big companies like Safari Land or some of these other like big gun companies, it just seems like they're not prioritizing citizens, generally speaking, because they're not prioritizing individual sales. I just ordered from a uh, first beer. Uh, actually forgot I ordered from them uh, four months to get my box. Um, and me being someone who would like to see this stuff within a week, I care about that, but a government agency, they don't care. They, they swipe the card, they wait a few months, they get it, they're done. Unless they're about to deploy, it really doesn't matter. But for individual citizens with Amazon Prime, different story. So yeah. we prioritize every order. We prioritize like individual people, obviously, because we ship, you know, same day, next day. Like it's insane right now. Uh, and with our lead times, uh, there's not like extra priority for military orders. It's just everyone gets stuff soon. Everyone yeah. gets stuff quickly. Uh, let's not talk about lead times too much right now. Uh, we, yeah, we won't talk about that. But, but I will you know say what I mean. <laughs> there, there is individual customers are a little harder to deal with. They are. Do it's you think, an individual Do you think there's for... any customers in this chat right now? No, probably not. Okay. They don't just like checking. us. Just uh, checking. So... They're like uh, people on my Twitch that are just there for free stuff. So one of the things that we have tried to do with the holsters is constant improvements. And I have a couple of examples of that. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that we used to do in the past was we used to make outside the waistband holsters out of a weight Kydex. This is 0 0.08 inches thick. It's very flexible and it's not quite as good at the retention uh, side of things based on how flexible it is as a more durable Ragnarok, which is made out of uh, 0.125. This is Kydex that is one eighth of an inch thick. It is much sturdier. It is much more rigid. People have driven cars over these things, and uh, you know, a couple of them have broken. We've had, to a my no, to my knowledge, we have had four, three or four Ragnaroks break, out of thousands. I'm very happy with that failure rate. Uh, one was driven over and broke. One is from a buddy of mine that just cracked, and he doesn't know why. And then the other one's a customer that, I don't know how they use or something, but out of the thousands and thousands and thousands of Ragnaroks that we've sold with like three or four confirmed breakages from people that have emailed us, I'm very happy. In fact, I'm, I'm, that's a, an astounding failure rate uh, I'm for a, a product. Uh, yeah. Every product will have a failure rate. I do think, this is a pet peeve of mine. I'm gonna, I wanna cover this real quick. I think this is important when you're talking about holsters, optics, weapon lights, whatever. People have this really unrealistic expectation in the gun industry of wanting invincibility at zero cost and maximum effectiveness for 200 bucks, uh, 100 bucks, 50 bucks. Uh, very unreasonable, very unrealistic expectation. Uh, they want mil spec, which that mil spec isn't usually necessarily really good, but mil spec quality for a hundred bucks. And it's like, yeah, that's not how it works. Everything breaks, everything runs out of batteries. Uh, I went out to the range the other day, my T2 was dead. T2s and aim points aren't supposed to ever die, is one expectation people have. Well, they do. Uh, the batteries do actually die, especially if you leave them on 11 or 12 or 11 or 10 all the time brightness. It's like a year of battery. Um, so I do have, a, it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, the expectation people have on American manufacturers or even foreign manufacturers, giving them the moon at a very affordable price. Affordable is also very relative. Uh, so there's some optics that are extremely expensive and there's a reason they're that expensive to have, you know, I just got a VCOG one to eight. That's like a $2,500 optic. Um, there's a reason it's like $2,500 though. The durability, the manufacturing that goes into it, the testing, the return to zero functionality, the uh, minimal POI, you know, point of impact shift. Uh, there's a lot that go, and then all the patents that go into it and there's the overhead and there's the manufacturing, there's the warranty. Like there's a reason some of these optics cost the money they do. And it's always very humorous to me when people say there's no reason that fill in the blank product should cost this amount of money. By all means, go out and do it yourself. Make it better, make it cheaper, make it faster, make it greater. I, I'm down. I would love to be able to buy a VCOG style optic for $200 that's just as good instead of 2,500 bucks, personally. Or let's say a, a sidecar, you know, for 20 bucks. So I saw someone saying make holsters for poor people. It would be amazing to make sidecars for 20 bucks for everyone, but with warranty, overhead, shipping, you know, supporting uh, 12 customer service people, uh, 
design, you know, dev department, six people, like that doesn't happen for $20 holsters. I'm sorry. Doesn't. Well, I mean, let's say we had 10 oh, yeah, million customers could, but, you know. and then we made them in uh, China. You know, it's possibly doable. So go sweatshops. go, go sweatshops. get a bunch more customers and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll look into sweatshops. They can't be I, that expensive. I will really. gladly welcome competition of all sorts. <laughs> I, 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 I crave it. Just for fun? Just for fun. I crave, oh. I crave competition for fun. Okay. It's very fun. Well, I'm, I'm a free market guy, but I, uh, I love competition. I love so competition good. too. It's going to be so fun. Uh, I don't really soon. have time for competition right now. I'm too busy <laughs> trying to... Uh... Oh, warranty claims. Oh, ah, this is... Too busy trying to... Uh... Yeah, hurry up. Never mind. Okay. Um, yeah, so warranty. Warranty claims. This is a real fun one. This is definitely something that sets holster companies apart is uh, how they handle their warranty. Uh, generally speaking, warranty is going to go hand in hand with a company's lead time. So if you have a company, a holster company, and we, I'll say... I can speak about uh, lead time because we've had good and bad. I've had, we've gone to eight weeks before, 10 weeks, probably longer. Uh, and now we're also at, for the past year, have been at like a week, two weeks. We usually overpromise or uh, over, over, we crap, <laughs> you say it. Uh, under promise, over deliver. Yeah, that's it. Under, yes. under promise, over deliver. Uh, so we say two to three weeks, two to four weeks. And then, you know, you get it in a few days and we lie to you and you get it sooner. Um, that's our big thing. <laughs> But uh, generally speaking, warranty issues for a lot of companies will be based off of the lead time because it, it's kind of an interruption. You have to start the whole CS process, which if it takes two days to get a response from a holster company, that's two days that are gone. Uh, there's probably a day of investigation to find out what the problem was. Uh, are you within the warranty policy? So another, say, two days. So four days now we're looking at being you know, sucked dry. And then the whole process can be in. Or maybe they want to wait for the product to come back. So yeah, four more days, so we're, at, we're at nine days from your initial contact with the company before the product can actually start getting made. Uh, so in order to have a fast uh, warranty process, you really need to have quality customer service from the get-go, but then you also mm -hmm, have yeah. got to have good manufacturing where it can, you know, it can go straight to the production line right away. So our warranty claims right now, or well, at least the, for the past year, um, have been within like a week, 10 days or so from contact to new product in hand. And that's, again, that's, I'm understating uh, because it's usually much faster than that. I will um, say- Warranty's huge. Yeah, so massive. that is, and that is, as as Lucas said, highly dependent on customer service team. I would say, uh, as T-Rex has grown and as we've had to change the way that we do things based on, um, based on what we've learned, customer service has grown the fastest and the yes. smoothest and to the highest level of quality. So what you should do next week is talk about yeah. customer service. I think uh, the plan for next week is actually uh, take you all over to the customer service department and uh, introduce you guys to all the fine folks over there and uh, talk about customer service in general. We've done this before. Kyle and I sat down and we talked in there. Um, some of you all were like, customer service, who cares? Or customer experience, we don't care about that. Um, but we'll actually go over there to the department and actually show you guys kind of what's going on. Um, I know uh, one of the guys is working on this insane Excel spreadsheet of like every handgun out there, uh, everything that's compatible with it, everything that isn't. Um, other holster companies that make stuff for it, if it's not us, tracking all those other companies, like literally tracking competition on what holsters they're making for certain guns that we then tell people uh, when they write to us, where it's like, hey, like I saw him today, I walked over, he was going through BNT guns. He had the USW and the well rod, the little uh, uh, Station 6 pistol. And I'm uh -huh. like, you're going that far to include two guns that we'll never make a holster for, guaranteed, um, that most likely I we're never a making rod. a holster for, and no one else really does, but he had it on the list because there actually are like two companies that make holsters for those guns. Um, so that's how far they're going with some of the documentation on, on the back end that we have for customer service. And I literally just looked over my shoulder and I kind of laughed because I was like, that's going pretty deep <laughs> down the nerd rabbit hole for guns uh, to support. Yeah. So um, yeah, well, that yeah, is usually fun. Now, another thing I'd say for warranty is uh, you mentioned we've only had a couple of these break. So generally what we have warranty issues is with this. So obviously that is something that we will break. address. Yeah. They do break sometimes. And we'll make sure that yeah. that's addressed. Yeah, the, 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 we'll, Later. we'll address the breaking for them. Yeah. Anyway, this um, right here see, what is an interesting <laughs> Talking about holsters is boring. 
<laughs> so here's an interesting product that I want to show you guys because this is a prototype for something oh. that we never made. No, someone, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, show them, yeah. So, so this is the kind of product testing that we do. Uh, we made a bunch of these. This is the Raptor 2.0. The Raptor 2.0 Good job, Isaac. Uh, isn't going to happen. Um, or at least this thing right here is not going to happen. But this is kind of an example of experiments that we were doing where we were trying to add more customizability. So this is our normal outside the waistband. You can play cribbage clip. on it. It's got lots of extra holes lots for stuff holes. going up and down and it's cantable and we experimented with holes versus slots. We, you know, and just wore this a whole bunch of different ways, experimenting with comfort, experimenting with the adjustability and so forth. That's the kind of testing that we do. I think I wore this for uh, a year and a half in some different configurations. That's the kind of testing that we generally do, trying to look for ways to improve stuff. Uh, and this one even has uh, the holes on the back so that you can put our Ragnarok belt loops on there and wear it outside the waistband, uh, but it's too, it's too flimsy. We want to do that with the 125. Also, I was going to say... I even, you did that? Okay. We made tons of those things. And we experimented with different things. Like we cut a slot so that you could cant this uh, particular belt clip and it was sliding. And so we switched to a square nut instead of hexagonal nut. And we cut little pixels, like little grooves into the side. So the square nut would lock into those and it wouldn't slide. It was super cool, but it was actually probably not the best way to uh, solve that particular problem. I will say, Going the whole modular route of like outside and inside the waistband in the same holster. I tried that way back in the day with the early Ragnaroks where I folded Kydex over in the back. Uh, not great. Not great. So this is, you know, like it's cool, but it's not. There's too many downsides. Not optimal. Yeah, yeah, not optimal. I will say though. Modular is not always better. Speaking of outside the waistband, we need to market the Ragnarok a little better with the belt loops. This is one of my favorite outside the waistband holsters. Just like With the these belt loops, it's a pain to put the belt loops on, but once they're on, it is actually, uh, it, it's a very good concealed OBB holster. Hugs very, very tight into well, the Well, I'm just gonna show the, the holster that I prefer to wear. Uh, no. <laughs> Chad, come take this from me and give me the one over there. Oh, and I want the gun. Give me, you put, you... oh my goodness, here. And I'll give me the gun. Oh, I need, I need the gun back. Oh, and the magazine. Thank you. Um, no, so uh, at, at the end of the day, if you are carrying, like if you're needing a, a, a gun that's concealed carry, uh, I far prefer having a dedicated like concealed carry setup. So this is my personal setup. Oh shoot, am I showing a gun? Well, I'm not holding it. No, I'm not holding it. But showing, uh, this is my setup right here and um, gives me everything. I never need to go outside the waistband. If I do have to go outside the waistband, what do I do? I take, a Ragnarok or something that's actually optimized for outside the waistband and I wear it for that. Uh, trying to do it all with like one rig and like one setup, uh, not super optimal in my opinion. It's not optimal, but I will say we do strive <laughs> to cover as many of the bases so that if you buy a holster from us, Thank it's you. gonna run with optics, it's gonna run uh, with, um, if you decide to go with a comp later, it's, it's gonna be as future proof as possible. And then with the Ragnarok, uh, it is as modular as we could get it with this particular hole pattern so that it works with belt loops, it works with belt slides, it works with the UBL and the CUBL, it works with RTI hangers, it works with a whole bunch of different things so that you can adapt it to what you are doing. But I would say outside the waistband, inside the waistband, two different things. Someone's asking, how long does a sidecar take to make? Um, so that's no. hard to explain. Well, how many, uh, how many people... It, okay, let's say Ragnarok. Let's say Ragnarok. How many people are involved in the production process on a Ragnarok? You probably know better than I do. Uh, well, many, there's a bunch of stuff. How many people touch it before it goes to shipping? Currently. Sure. We're right in the middle of rebuilding our entire production pipeline. Sure. You may yes. not know this, yeah. but... Oh uh, Let me read it. <laughs> <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> um, but basically, there's a bunch of steps. First step is we actually take a piece of Kydex and we heat it till it's hot and then we like vacuum cheese. form it on top of the thing. And then the form shape goes to the CNC machine to have the holes drilled and cut out. So that's two people. Then somebody has to buff it. Then somebody has to bend it into this actual shape here. And then somebody has to put hardware on it. So usually uh, five people touch the holster. Uh, although there's some other that's steps in there too. Like there's, a, there's usually somebody cleaning it. And, I'm, uh, I'm saying every single unique person touching it. Every, every step. It's like 10. It's like 10 people. Well, there's, there's a bunch there's of people. hardware and then shipping. I'm okay, so shippers, shippers, shippers touch it. it. The yeah. whole, the whole, because that's part of it. The whole process, it's like eight, 
Eight people? I, I, would, I would say eight, eight people. people in production. Now, Dev yep. makes a ton of these to start with, and then we come along and we make tweaks during. Uh, yeah, but, but basically eight people will have been involved in, in Manufacturing. making... Manufacturing. Shipping, any, any holster that you get out there. Yep. Now, it could be, uh, I mean, it, it's eight less. today. No, it's not going to oh, be less. Oh, sure. I mean, it's... It's always, and that's the thing. So when it goes to like, uh, how much time does it take? Like, I remember how much time it took to make a holster when it was just me, because I would kind of, kind of knew the whole process. Like it's, you know, three minutes to get this done. And it's like three minutes to do this. And it's two minutes to do this. And back in the day, I made like five bucks an hour, uh, especially taking on stupid projects. I was learning to do stupid guns and dumb crap. But, um, oh, Agent KP30? But the whole, uh, uh, Celtic pistol actually was uh, one of the worst. Uh, and uh, oh, and, and the best was a Ruger. Uh, that is really dumb because uh, the Caltech Ruger, pistols uh, put a bell clip on them. Is it called no a holster? A P95 or no, it's the weird one. It's horrible. Anyway, um, oh, and the PX Storm, that one's horrible as well because the trigger guard, the the front nose, the snoot, the beak of it is, is wider and fatter than the trigger guards. You have to pad that whole thing out. Anyway, um, so uh, where was I going with that? So yeah, the time to make a holster is kind of kind of weird because it does have to travel between a lot of stations, um, and that's when having like mass manufacturing, making you know batches and making you know a Giant lot of the same thing helps helps a lot yeah. uh, versus you know one person taking it through you know the whole process. So at some point, going from small custom to bigger kind of. It just changes everything. It changed everything for us like four or five years ago uh, when we started doing CNC machines. We started, you know, culling some products off of the list that we were going to make holsters for, standardizing a little bit better, not being custom. I mean, we're kind of a hybrid. We're not really like full custom because you can't not. you can't send in your weird gun to get made. You can pick whatever color we you want. We are made to order. We're made to order, but we're, we're not, not custom. custom. We're not a custom shop anymore. We haven't been a custom shop for years. Honestly, we never really were, kind of were at the beginning. Yeah. Um, but there is a big difference between holster companies in that regard. Because you'll have some guys who literally just, they, they, they crave the custom weird crap. Um, and then you have some guys that are like, eh, it's all, all holsters are black. Um, we only make them for Glock and kind of like Raven now. Like we only do like two different models. Uh, they're all black and that's all you get. Uh, injection mullet, it's all you get. Um, and then we've kind of, toyed with like where do we want to go do we want to still be sort of custom made to order do we want to go full like mass production you know so we're kind of in the middle i see t-rex as being in the middle of we do offer a lot of different guns and and types of holsters and colors and stuff we're not just going to one color only or three colors only um but we're not a custom shop and i do think that's important for people to understand uh if you are looking for a holster company to make your you your thigh holster for a raging judge with a scope on it oh, yeah. that's compensated with a flashlight lasers, and not and lasers. not like and not a normal light, and grips like an NC star <laughs> something something that's real fine uh, so we're not that company anymore I'm although sorry. I will we're say not. that we have tried to emphasize the things that are important so we offer a bunch of fun colors not a gazillion but we offer some fun colors but we have emphasized more customizability for you, the user, and a little bit less on our end. So things like, we want you to have more adjustability for your holster, we want more modularity, more things that you can run it with, more things that you can attach it to. Uh, that is a higher priority for us than more options that you can pick on our website, because that will let you experiment, test the gear, come up with stuff. So like, those are our priorities. When did we ditch sweat guards? Uh, it was- Like a year ago? Not quite, but- um, Six oh, yeah. months. So uh, I have here secret blueprints. Did you listen to my uh, my podcast where I talked about right to repair and uh, no, and blueprints and open source stuff? Like this is the actual blueprints of the sidecar back when it had. Rip us no off. Guard. Go ahead. Everyone does. <laughs> well, it's actually um, we never officially open sourced this, but we kind of unofficially did. And these are the actual blueprints. If you got calipers, you can make the uh, the no guard. And then you got here the mid guard, which we are currently doing. And then we that have the high guard, angle. which we no longer actually do. For the Glock, exactly. this is the exact angle. Or yeah. it was the exact yeah, yeah. angle. Yeah, but other guns, it gets kind of Now, I will say, some of people are asking, like, are we making massive changes to the sidecar in the future? That cannot be commented on, of course. But if some of you were clever, you'd go to the website to see if this shirt is still available or in stock. Um, so uh, moving on, uh, Cloud Defensive. Someone's asking about, hey, Cloud Defensive new, new Cloud Defensive's new pistol light. Uh, no, they let's they have stated they have stated some very bold very bold claims as far as what their light is going to do. 
I have not seen one yet. I have been in contact with them to find out what's going because we have to. I mean, it's like if we're going to make a holster for it, like holster support for a light is necessary for a light to be successful, a, a pistol light in particular. Um, so I've been talking to them. I haven't seen anything yet, but if they deliver on what they're saying at the price point for what they're saying, I think that's going to be a great pistol light. I'm, I think it's going to be ugly. I, I don't think there's going to be a lot of form factor just based on cloud defensives lights from the past. Uh, they're not like really cool looking. And then um, here's, here's my But that's opinion. okay. But that's yeah. all right. It, it's not bad. It doesn't I just, care what it looks like as long as it's easy to make a holster for. Just saying. Yeah, that's his position. My position is <laughs> hey, people want their lights to look cool on guns. Like there's form factor and appearance yeah. and professionalism. So, so we'll see what it looks like. But if they deliver on what they are claiming, uh, that's going to be an awesome light for sub 260 bucks that does all the things they say. I think it's flush fit with a 19, so they're not going like, you know, a big boy. They're like keeping it small. Uh, I think that's great. So we'll see if they deliver. We'll see yeah. when. Um, I, I like everything Cloud's doing right now, with the exception of I'm not a huge fan of their owl light. Their rain is super big, but, you know, it's whatever. But their trade-in program... Uh, trading program for dealers and uh, how they handle warranties and lights that get confiscated after shootings and stuff. Uh, they're, they're, they're running their company in a way that definitely puts you all or me uh, first. And that's how it should be. Um, I, I don't think their products are, you know, like going to take me to the moon or anything. But I think the way they're running yeah, their business is great. lights will do that, though. I, o lights will. Yeah. Just oh definitely. <laughs> Uh, people asking so, when the adult sizes of the Turks Orms shirt comes out. That's uh, a good why question. Is, why is Turks Orms not uh, like, not a, a fun meme like beaks are? I don't know. Um, Turks Orms is hilarious. I don't know. Well, they're just I don't saying. Know. It's hilarious. I would wear one. I, I'd wear one more than any of our other shirts. Um, Do yeah. you make a brand storm? I don't think we'll ever make holsters for those. There's no, a bunch of people please, asking various gun. questions about the uh, production retooling, and uh, they're thinking like maybe we're installing just like another CNC machine. I'm actually actually kind of annoyed by that. We have installed a ton of CNC machines without ever uh, even a hiccup in production. Do you want to say how many we have? Uh, well, I, I, I'd have to stop and think, but we basically have four. Well, no, I can't, I can't actually even itemize it because there's a couple doing a thing that we can't talk about. But uh, there's, there's like, some very cool stuff, very there's cool things back there doing very cool stuff. But We have room to add a lot more, Do you more remember too. a couple of years ago when we moved... Uh, from one shop to another shop, and it was seamless uh, as far as customers were concerned. Like, yeah. like I, I think we added an extra week to lead time, yeah. and we moved and we, the entire shop. So uh, I, I'm 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 slightly offended, sir, that you would think that uh, we stopped production for, you know, one, uh, one extra, one extra, two extra, or we could add, we could add, is, uh, we could add four or five. Uh, like let's let's say and we have room for it. Let's say we got a big government contract or something weird, or we opened up to dealers all of a sudden, which we currently only sell to two, one in England and Royal Range. Uh, let's say we opened up to dealers. We would probably cart in here another five to six CNC machines, and you all wouldn't notice because you all would just be getting your holsters and your stuff within you know our lead time of a week, two weeks, whatever. It's possible. Um, it's also possible that. Adding sure. that many at one time would be, you know, um, it would take longer. Nights. But th the thing is, whenever Saturdays. whenever we go to make improvements or mass changes, the first question is, how is it going to affect our current obligations, our current expectations for being able to order, being able to, you know, get stuff right away, warranty? Like that's literally the first part of the conversation yeah. is how do we handle that? Like moving to the building next door. Uh, we're doing a big expansion onto that building. How's that going to affect our inventory, which it's not, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, like how, how's that going to affect current operations? Because I've seen holster companies, there was one in particular, they got a big government contract. They flexed it's very hard to get the contract. There's a $20 million contract. Uh, it ultimately fell through, but in the process, they put the citizens yeah. and individual orders on the back burner. Lead times went to four months. I capitalized on that quite a bit at the time, which I felt really bad for this company. But at the same time, I was like, well, if you guys can't get a holster from them, I'll help you out. Yeah. Like, you can give me your money instead. But uh, but they, but they, it, it was an issue because they didn't prioritize you guys uh, over the government contract, and they ultimately got screwed over by it. Um, so stuff like that does happen. Companies, you know... They, they move away from their primary goals, their primary customer base. They forget the primary customer base, where they came from. And uh, that can be a problem. That can be a really big yeah. problem in the long run. And, and one thing I will say, 
that uh, I really appreciate about this company. Even before I was part of it, the focus on the customer was was uh, very, very high. And do you remember a conversation we had with Colonel Dahl back in the time when our, our lead times were longer? And he actually was talking about, hey, should we even take people's money this early in the process when it's so many weeks? We oh, yeah. We had that conversation. Now, yeah, fortunately, our lead times are now so short that if we take your money, uh, and it's credit card companies make it hard for us to take your money later. But if we you order, we take your money. Wow. We have a piece of Kydex generally getting cut for your holster real quick. So we've actually started to cut material and pay people. Uh, don't forget the greater really purpose. early on. That's right. What was that? Uh, don't forget the greater purpose. That's correct. And the greater purpose of what we're trying to do is important. It's part of the reason that we like we like holsters, even though they are. Um, this is a good question. Does T-Rex have any interest to expand their footprint in the DOD market space? Honestly, only if it doesn't impede our sales and commitments to you all. Um, I have zero interest in chasing massive military contracts because generally speaking, uh, they leave it in, they create the contract in such a way that they're, they're the priority in the, the relationship so they can drop it like that. I've seen it happen. Um, plus it generally affects you guys. If we have bad business savvy in how we take the $2 million contract, $1 million contract, you know, uh, even $500,000 contract, uh, and it affects you guys, uh, for me, that's a business fail. Uh, even though the, the money and the notoriety of, ooh, NSN, big, big army contract. Uh, but at the end of the day, if, if in the process of doing that, I screw you guys over, that's not good for business. Um, so I'm not interested in relying on the government. I'm not interested in relying on them for sales. I've seen that have problems with that in the industry as well, where companies solely focus on the government as their sole customer or their main customer. But that's a very fickle customer that can go to someone else. And if you haven't built the inroads for individual sales, your sales do this. Um, so I have no interest in chasing that. Uh, we don't have an LE mill sales dude running around military bases driving up support. I know of a few other holster companies that have done that. Um, I'm just not interested in that kind of activity. I've had conversations with people, uh, companies like ADS and Quantico and places like that that do uh, contract quotes for big mill and stuff. Um, but I just don't, I'm just not that interested. I'd rather build our customer base uh, with individuals uh, in the community, whether it's LE, mill, civilians, I don't care, uh, than rely on government money. Mm -hmm. Like I just don't, we, we get government sales uh, in special operations and stuff or through ADS and Quantico, but it's like, you know, 30 holsters for an ODA, 20 holsters, you know, 100 holsters for MARSOC, you know, very little tiny orders that literally are a, a blip in regards to what we're doing for all of you guys. So it's not a big deal. Uh, we don't have to rely on it. It's like bonus money. Cool. Bonus customers. Um, but it's not you guys getting screwed over because we take on something that's too big to chew. So, uh, I've yeah. had no interest in chasing that personally. Um, yeah, just, you've, you've all care. seen companies suffer because of that. And uh, yeah, also, I've spent a little bit of time working in that world, and it's not as fun as you think. And Ouch, uh, this, yeah. guy, this guy's saying ripped off by a holster company one year and still waiting. That sucks. That really sucks. And I'll say, holster companies start out. And I'm going to say I did too. I started T-Rex Arms not knowing exactly where it was going to go. At first, it was like my fun hobby. No, it wasn't a hobby. It was full-time right away. But I didn't know where it was going to go. But a lot of holster companies, like most companies don't get past the first year. So they start, they build an Instagram. It's really fun while it's new and it's the new thing. And you're really motivated. Um, but a lot of holster companies drop off after a year because it's a hobby to them. It's a side gig, right? Um, if, if you're going to start a company, like in my opinion, uh, you... If you're really going to go through the trouble to do it, uh, do it all the way. Um, put your two, three years in, get past the first year. Um, don't screw customers over and not send them holsters after they uh, order from you. And I've seen a lot of holster companies. Even back when I started, I remember I was on a forum with, uh, there's like 50 holster companies. Uh, there's only like four uh, that are still around from that forum back when I first started. And we were all new. We were all like newbies. You know, Filster had his video that taught us all how to make holsters, which I'll say credit, big props to him for doing that 40-minute video because I learned a lot from it. Uh, so there were like 40 of us who were all small. You know, I was kind of hitting Instagram and, you know, doing some stuff that they weren't doing. Uh, there's only like four of the companies left from, from back then. Most of them, they just kind of, you know, they weren't interested anymore. Uh, they didn't have a lot of ambition to begin with. It was sort of a hobby thing. It was kind of cool. It's kind of fun. You can do it for really cheap. Um, and the problem is those companies screw you guys over. Um, and the same thing happens with 
night mission companies that start out as a hobby company as uh, business expense yeah. uh, write-offs, and then you guys get screwed over, and I hate it. It's very hard to do. As you can I tell I'm very say, passionate about this. <laughs> uh, have I told you my bug analogy? No. So like, absolutely. as companies grow, uh, they're like bugs. Um, you can't really advance to the next stage of a bug without turning into a, basically a different kind of bug. Like you have to leave the larval stage to be oh, the next kind of it. bug, and uh, that's. Can I, mean, I be I a assume, bug with a beak? I assume it's unpleasant for the bug to do that. But you find yourself, you know, advancing from one type of company to another, uh, and, and you basically have to change forms and learn how to do new stuff and bring on people. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me of a piece of advice that uh, my father-in-law gave you, uh, real early on at T-Rex. Oh. He told you, and I remember this because I was paying very close attention I'm, to him. I'm sick if I remember it. <laughs> uh, I was paying very close attention. Uh, he said, to start a company, it, you are reliant, completely reliant on your own ability. Oh, yeah. And then to grow the company, that is entirely uh, reliant on your humility. That's so true. that is a really interesting thing yeah. that uh, he gave the advice to you, but was I was listening. That's good. And, that was a long time ago, uh, I have, too. I have uh, remembered that ago. because... Growing, growing the company has required a lot more humility than uh, <laughs> you would expect. Um, and learning about holsters has been um, definitely, uh, it's been fun, but it's also yeah. been um, kind of frustrating at times to spend a lot of times tinkering with it's how true. you get that Gen 3 Glock to fit good in that Gen 3 5 holster. Yeah. Yeah, or you, Sig making a legacy. I wasn't even going to talk uh, about Sig. Elite, Dark, Templar, Scorpion, um, Scorpion APX, Gun. Optic compatible, uh, competition ready. And an FTE. Know. I just add more titles. And on. the FTE version is slightly different size. Someone's than the asking. Gray version. Uh, holster for a Mark Twenty Three. Uh, we so don't. We don't. No one makes kites that big. We don't make. I'll, I'll, let me. I'll put it this way. Guns like that aren't popular for a reason. They're novelty guns like Desert Eagles. Nobody is going to make holsters for stuff like that when the customer base is a, a, a very small bug. Um, it's just, it's not going to happen. And I know it's hard for some people to like understand because you like the gun. You like the Mark 23. You like the Desert Eagle. You like he your, probably doesn't your, your, your fill in the does. blank gun. You just think everyone else does. No, people don't run around carrying Mark 23s uh, ready to go or Desert Eagles. So, Sometimes the government makes uh, them carry Mark I will 23s. Say, That's the only time. I will say though, if you do have a weird pistol, and I've got a few weird ones myself, uh, one of the best options out there is a good nylon holster. Um, LBT makes this really cool, I actually really want one, uh, nylon holster that fits, I mean, from an operational standpoint, they make a lot of sense. You can fit a lot of different guns in the same holster, so you're not having to like, you know, bring in like four different work holsters. Um, so now the problem with nylon is if it's uh, poorly constructed, it can get in the trigger guard and cause issues, but you might actually want to look into a nylon holster that can fit whatever weird, stupid, weird long big gun you have with whatever weird weapon light you have old light a pec 16 or something or 14 i think is what it's called um it's like a nylon holster uh, like the lbt or something yeah so i i have a thing that i actually want to make oh yeah after well, we're, you know we're, we're after, not spoiling anything well no this is a totally different thing oh, okay. after i have an idea for thing. uh these belt clips are from our website those are the belt loops they come in one and a half inch they come in one and three quarter inch depending on your belt yes. size they go on the Ragnarok. Uh, you can also use them for other stuff, but they're specifically for the Ragnarok. Yeah. Someone's asking about tuckable holsters. Uh, we now sell the discrete carry concepts clips, which my understanding is are good for tucking. Yes? No? Maybe? Um, yeah. Well, you can... You Chad's can, saying yes. You can you tuck... Can't. You can't. They're saying You saying can more. tuck these here. He's saying more. The, the, He's saying more The tuckable. metal clips are more tuckable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not make all holsters in left hand? Because you're only 9% of customers. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, again, it comes back to numbers... The right amount of sales and left-handed people are nine percent of the population. Nine or ten, there's debate. Um, so it's not always uh, from a stocking perspective with space and inventory. For, it's not business. It it doesn't work. It, it doesn't work. Um, now we would I will like say, to. If we, you were but, to make everything to order instead of stocking stuff, it changes things a little bit. It, it's true, and that's where like a custom holster company that doesn't care but it's also going to charge you through the nose because, frankly, I don't think they charge enough. I should have charged $300 for some of the projects I worked on back in the day, and I, I couldn't because I was like, well, going rate's like 60 bucks. I'll charge $60. Six hours later, you know, plus even more time, I'm like, oh, wow, I made no money. I will um, say in the future so. we do want to help out you wrong-handed people. We would like to. We would like to have. I know Kyle, that's a big thing. I think, I'm, I'm like 90% sure he wants lefties for everything because, I mean, obviously customer service deals with it, and I know I'd like that too. It's just 
from mm -hmm. a sales business numbers. It's all numbers. You know it Kyle's here in the work. chat though, right? I do, but okay. I didn't want to put him on the spot and have him tell you know me. I'm gonna do that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Claymore holster. That was an April Fool's joke. It's it's amazing how many people think it's real. That is, I will say, I could say. Uh, I haven't made a customer's holster in probably five years, six years, six years. Um, but the Claymore sidecar, I actually did make myself. Um, that was the last holster I made, and before then it was years. Um, so I actually did make the Claymore sidecar, uh, the one that we used for April Fools, uh, myself. And that was fun. Um, I'm pretty rusty at it, but I can still make a holster that works. Uh, getting retention on a claymore though is very difficult. So, but I, I've done it now, so I know what I'm doing. If you know a government uh, agency wants something. Now, now, Lucas, if you'd ever been in the military, you'd oh. know that that setting off a claymore when it's inside your own pants doesn't work as well as it does in the movies. Oh, you're not wrong. Well, I think it'll work great. Okay, well, I think it's great. It's a good deterrent. <laughs> Walk in with a little. Uh, you're just like holding a string tied to it. Yeah, I think it's great. I still think that somebody in Texas the little should lasers make a Claymore belt buckle. <laughs> Claymore belt buckle. Yeah. Um, if you ever want to cash for more, uh, please let me know. That's what we do. Cool. Well, hey, you can always email us. If you're, if you're interested or you want to work with us, just email the team at team at trex-arms.com. Uh, they'll put you in touch with me or they'll work on it. Uh, their own uh, sales guy there in the CS who can handle the handles that sort of thing. Um, I'm down. Oh. Just don't prioritize it. The Gray Man Network, oh, which I, I appreciate a lot, asks, what has been your favorite holster innovation since the inception of T-Rex Arms? Some changes can't be made quietly. Our IWB holsters are temporarily unavailable for purchase while we finish the last major steps in retooling our production line. You can join the waitlist below to be notified when we bring the IWB holsters back. Oh, I, I wasn't supposed to read that one. Yeah, why'd you read the last part? I was okay. like, what are you doing? I, apparently, you can join the waitlist below. You can below. get on the waitlist. If you're not on the waitlist, you should be on there. Uh, I'm actually hoping... There's a lot of things going on right now. Uh, I'm hoping once some of them are done, uh, we'll be able to focus on my my ultimate goal or one of the big goals here at T-Rex with our content and stuff is uh, more exclusive content on our website, hosted on our website that is not censored by powers that be. Um, I also am looking forward to having streams on our website. Yep. Uh, where we can show guns, or we can talk about whatever we want. Weird concept. Um, I'm hoping next year to have that functionality. Right now I'm using Twitch because they're actually less uh, anti-gun than uh, YouTube. And um, I do two streams a week, one with gaming and giving away stuff. And I've started to critique shooting videos that people submit to me, uh, and I give advice. And then uh, I also do armory streams in here where I actually show guns and kit and answer questions. But I'm hoping in the future we'll have that at T-Rex Arms on our website hosted by us or, you know, by a server system, but um, you know what I mean. So I, I'm looking forward to having more content through our newsletter, uh, ex more exclusive training type stuff that doesn't go to Instagram. Uh, we have the three-hour training rifle class that's up right now, which has now been watched for like a year and a half or something crazy by people within like two, three weeks. That's just combined watch time. Just yeah. stolen. That Still much nothing time compared to like lives. World of Warcraft or you something. Call me the, impressive. Hey, can I be called the time thief? I mean, that is a year of people's time that we could have I used like to reconfigure our production line. You're right. I'm the time thief. I've also stolen, uh, it's like 30,000, whatever the view count is on our YouTube. I don't know. Uh, more years of people's lives with our YouTube. So uh, I'm the time thief. Time well spent. I like it. So anyway. you. It, this, is, this has been, a, speaking of time well spent, this has been a long live stream. Is. You plug the Twitch. Uh, we're building out. Aimbotkin. We've, we're, we're building out. Yeah, Aimbotkin. We're building out our media resiliency plan. Um, we also do a podcast occasionally, and we back up these lives on the podcast, although this one was, it was sort of visual enough that you probably want to watch the video. Probably. Um, wow. And then... Uh, a lot of rain <laughs> over this hour. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty high priority. Uh, in the meantime, we're relatively busy, so... Uh, uh, not actually 100% positive that there will be a dedicated audio-only podcast, but we have been running dedicated audio podcasts and YouTube live streams simultaneously, uh, the same week even, to give you guys extra more content. But there's something going on in the back. I forget what it is, but it was, uh, it was, uh, <laughs> hang on a second. No, never mind. I now, remember what it was. I think they know now. They'll, they'll know it after, yeah, the, they know. Yeah, so They've thank you very much. It. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, go sign up on the, uh, uh, the wait list for the product that we can't talk about, that you can't buy, but eventually you will be able to. And uh, come back next week for a live stream where we'll be talking to our customer support people. Uh, those are the yeah, real, next week. the real most valuable players. Uh, no, no leaks on that one either. Never.
It's a good thing we didn't uh, leak anything yeah. on this one. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you all next time.